So our speaker for the first topic today is Enrique Miralles Dorth, which who is a PhD student in the CCFE, the Coulomb Center for Fusion Energy in the UK, with the University of Liverpool. His research focuses on uncertainty quantification methods applied to fusion power plant design. Enrique, thank you for being here again, because he already uh, delivered this talk in, in Spanish some, some time ago, and it was great. So looking forward, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Paco, for your um, introduction. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to talk about, just to check, can you hear me? We can see and hear you perfectly. Okay, yep. good. So I'm, I'm going to talk about um, magnetic confinement fusion. Um, I will go through um, a bit the basics of magnetic confinement, and then I will try to explain um, the two main um, concepts that we have here on Earth, and then some of the main systems of a, of a reactor. So um, the general idea is that we want to have a system where some fusion reaction re reactions are happening inside and then some energy is being produced. So um, first we need to um, provide some energy to create the system. And then we need to provide energy to the system to bring it to fusion conditions. And we also have some energy losses from the system from radiation and so on. We, we always have losses. And we say that when the energy produced um, in the system equals to the losses and the energy that we have to provide to the system to bring it to fusion conditions, we say that we have achieved ignition. This means that this, the, the energy produced in the system um, itself makes this, um, the reactions self-sustained. So we, we don't need to bring um, energy um, to the system to bring it to fusion, to fusion conditions because the fusion reactions themselves are doing that job for us. So the Lawson criterion um, tells us what are the requisites that should be fulfilled um, to achieve ignition for its type of fusion reaction. Um, this Lawson criterion is a triple product of the density, the temperature, and the energy confinement time. And this product has to be um, greater than, than some value A. And we know this value A is the uh, minimum for the deuterium tritium fusion reaction. That's why we um, aim to make deuterium tritium fusion because it's the it's the easiest one. Um, so we need to make this this product large enough. We know some methods to increase the density. We know we know some processes to increase the temperature. But how do we increase the energy confinement time of a system? That's a bit trickier, and um, we take advantage of the fourth state of matter, which is called um, plasma. To understand what plasma is, let's imagine we have a solid and we heat up the solid, providing some energy. Eventually, the solid will melt and we turn into liquid. If we keep providing energy to the liquid, um, it will start boiling and then turn into a gas. And what happens when we keep providing energy to the gas, when we keep heating the gas, is that we eventually will achieve plasma. To understand this, um, we know that atoms are usually composed of protons, neutrons, and electrons. And when the number of protons equals to the number of electrons, we say that the, the atom is uh, neutrally charged. It has neutral charge because the positive charge of the uh, proton is being compensated um, with the negative charge of the electrons. But when we provide energy to this atom, um, eventually what might happen is that um, the electrons might leave the bounds of the atom and then we will end up with a pair ion free electron. This, is, this process is called ionization. And that's why plasma is also usually called ionized gas because it's like a gas where um, electrons and ions coexist independently, like separate particles. The trick comes when um, we know that the um, charged particles um, feel a force when they are under the effects of a magnetic field. So we can use magnetic fields to um, exert some forces to the um, charged particles. This Lorentz force is perpendicular to the velocity of the particle and um, the magnetic field. So the early idea was to make this sort of magnetic bottle. It was called magnetic bottle with two parallel coils. These co coils will generate this um, magnetic field. It was stronger as we move close to the, to the coil and then weaker in the middle. And the idea was to confine particles in the weakest region of the, of the um, bottle because when the particles try to escape this way or this way, they felt this 
um, Lorentz force that is perpendicular, and then the particles eventually um, bounced back to the middle of the of the bottle. But the problem is that when the velocity of the particle is completely parallel to the uh, magnetic field, then this particle is not is not going to feel any force, and then they could escape. So we we have some kind of confinement loss here because the, the particles that have a very large um, velocity parallel to the magnetic field then might escape this confinement. So they thought, okay, um, let's close the, the the magnetic field lines and let's make like a torus like this. It was a good idea actually. This is starts to look uh, more like a modern um, reactor, but it still has its problems. And if we take a section here. We see that the distance between A and B is smaller than the distance between C and D. So the magnetic field of the orange line is greater than the magnetic field of the uh, green line. And the consequence of this is that um, the positive charge particles uh, will move in a opposite direction um, to the um, of the negative charge particles. So we have some kind of charge separation. And we, we, when we have a region of the space that is positively charged and the region of the space that is negatively charged, we have a electric field um, between these two regions. And this electric field, what it's going to do is it's going to push both particles towards the um, towards outside the reactor. So we'll have some confinement loss. So they had to figure out how to um, short circuit this electric um, electric field. And the idea is that we need we need to eliminate um, the fact that there are field lines that are stronger than others. So we need to make this orange um, field line to be as, as strong as the, um, as, the, as the green one. So we need to um, make these field lines to um, drive a trajectory like this, um, but also up and down. So this, this um, field line, this trajectory is called helical. Um, this is a helical um, field line. And what it does essentially is that it connects the uh, bottom part of the of the um, reactor with the upper part of the reactor and the electrons, because they are much lighter than ions, they will accelerate towards the um, upper region of the space and then they will short circuit, they will shield this electric field. And this is how um, the two modern concepts of magnetic confinement fusion were born, because they essentially differ on how the helical magnetic field um, is uh, generated. Um, in the case of the tokamak, um, we have a um, central solenoid in the middle, and this central solenoid is going to um, drive a current um, through the plasma, and this current in the plasma is going to generate a poloidal um, magnetic field like like this one. So it's going to make to generate a magnetic field that is going to wrap the the torus like this. It's like the um, the red line. And the way the accelerator um, generates this helical, produces this helical magnetic field is, is naturally because they, they shape the magnets like this um, in a non axisymmetrical way to naturally generate a magnetic field that is helical itself. Um, so um, this is uh, Van der Steyn 7X, this is one accelerator in Greifswald, Germany. And as I said, um, magnetic field installators are um, naturally helical because of the shape of the of the magnets. Um, it's complicated from the engineering point of view because manufacturing these um, magnets uh, it's very complicated. Um, they have to be very precise, and but they have some other advantages regard, regarding physics. For example, they are free from some of the um, tokamak transport problems um, relating particles and heat. And they also work in steady state because um, we don't in installators we don't we don't have this central solenoid to make the the poloidal field we need to ramp up a current through the central solenoid and we cannot ramp it um, indefinitely we have to stop at some point so that's why tokamaks work uh, in a pulse regime um, but it's much easier to build a tokamak than a installator and the problem is that physics are harder for tokamaks. We say that tokamaks are a generation ahead of the stellators because we have built many more tokamaks than stellators. So we know more about tokamak um, um, construction than stellator construction. Um, 
and this is MAST in the in the UK. Um, so, what are the main systems of a, a fusion reactor? Um, I want to talk first about the heating systems. How do we heat the plasma? Um, there are three main methods. Um, two of them are common for tokamaks and slaters, but the ohmic heating, um, the ohmic heating is not um, available because for slaters because um, the ohmic heating is basically the plasma, the plasma, um, the plasma current, the, the current that goes through the plasma, is the one that um, heats the plasma itself because of um, the uh, conduction losses, right? We have some resistance in the plasma, and it's the Joule effect basically. But because in the slaters we don't have this homic, this central solenoid and this plasma current, then um, we don't have um, ohmic heating. But then radio frequency heating and neutral beam ejection are, are common. Um, so in the case of radio frequency heating, what we do is we drive microwave um, radiation that has the same frequency as the um, electrons in the plasma or ions in the plasma, and then we excite we we excite those um, particles. And also we have neutral beam injection. What we do here is basically we inject uh, very high energy particles, neutral particles, because we cannot inject charged particles because of the magnetic field. Um, so when we inject these neutral particles, they collide with the particles in the plasma and then they hit the plasma. Um, what else we have? So the vacuum vessel is where the uh, plasma is going to be generated. It needs to be, um, in vacuum and also very clean because any impurity that we might have inside is going to make um, the, some loss of um, energy confinement time. We, we need to we need to have this vacuum vessel very very clean from impurities because we don't want any um, unwanted radiation. Um, also, the cryostat because of the magnets they operate that uh, with the superconducting regimes uh, they need to be very um, very cold so. We need to um, to cool them in the cryostat. Um, the breeder blanket, the objective of the breeder blanket is to um, produce tritium. Um, the neutrons being produced uh, from the DT fusion reactions um, will be absorbed by absorbed by this um, breeder blanket, and then they will interact. These neutrons will interact with the lithium of the blanket, and we will, they will produce some tritium. The problem with the problem of DT fusion is that tritium is a very scarce um, material on Earth, and we need to um, we need to um, build we need to, to create it, um, and that's that's the objective of the breeder blanket. Um, the deuterium is fine; uh, we can find it in the ocean. It's not it's not a problem, and the objective of the diverter is to remove um, the excess of heat from the plasma and also. Um, the ashes of uh, the uh, reactions and some other impurities that might um, appear from the interaction of the plasma with the um, surface of the of the vacuum vessel, and that's that's about it. So we need to uh, recall that in magnetic confinement fusion, the Lawson criterion is fulfilled with large ener energy confinement times, and the next uh, presentation you will see that in ICF is the density what matters. Um, Slaters and tokamaks differ on how the helical field is achieved. So in slaters, we um, we build these magnets with a very weird shape to make this um, helical um, field. And in the case um, of tokamaks, we have this combination of a poloidal um, magnetic field and toroidal magnetic field that the combination of both is going to produce this helical field. And the main systems of a reactor are common for both slaters and tokamaks. So um, that's uh, most of the things that I wanted to say. I'm not sure if I'm missing anything, but um, thank you for watching. And if you have any questions,